I get to talk to you on part two. How long will this be? We established last week, we established last week that you have to face your crisis, that you cannot keep ignoring that you're in a crisis. Ignoring it does nothing for you. It just makes the pain increase and intensify, and it makes you mad at God that he hasn't answered in the time frame for which you thought he should have answered. So we talked about how to face your crisis, how to face your crisis. Uh, if you'd like to pick that up, CD form or DVD form, we have some of those available from last week, available out in the hallway at the end of the service. Today, we want to answer the question, how long will this be? How long will this be? Because that's the second question we ask. We, we get past why it happened. It happened. Now you're facing it. The next question is, how long will this be? Wouldn't it be good if God gave you an expiration date? Wouldn't it be great if God just told you, all you got to do is wait till this time next year, and your life will be 180 degrees better? God doesn't do that, does he? He doesn't tell us that. There's no scripture in the Bible that says that God gave someone an expiration date on their situation. Not one, but it was 70 years. One. And it was 70 years. So sometimes we don't need to hear. Amen. Amen. And what if God would have told Abraham, yeah, you're going to have a child? He was like, yeah. He told him that. Yeah. But what if he told him 25 years from now? He'd be like, uh, I'm good. Find somebody else. Because <laughs> sometimes the date will move us from the place of obedience. So we all have the question. We all have a question. I want to ask you a question. How many of you all have ever made a wish before? Just show me by a raise of hands. Made a wish. Okay, we're, in the, we're in good company. Almost all wishes fall in two categories. We either wish for something good to happen or for something bad to stop. Wouldn't we agree with that? We wish for something good to happen or for something bad to stop. Either way, our wishes cause us to end up somewhere we currently are not. To a more comfortable place. To a, more, to a place of ease and relaxation and joy and peace and happiness. We're wishing for something bad to end and for something good to begin. Now I need to share with you, I don't know where and when the devil snuck into the Christian church and begin to teach that the child of God, the person trying to find God, will never have any problems now that they're coming to God, or now that they're in God. I don't know when and where he started dropping seeds of thoughts that says we will never have money problems, we will never have issues, we will never have uh, turbulences, we will never have problems, and and resistance. I don't know when, and, and even if we do have them, I don't know how he made us to believe it's only going to last for a week or so. But somehow that's been our mindset in the church today that we believe that because we're in church that we will never have a problem lasting more than a week or two. And yet, in the text that we are about to read, we find a man by the name of King David, a man after God's own heart, yelling out to God, how long? How long will I have to endure this? How long? Well, see, we all have dreams on the inside of us. We all have a dream that one day things are going to be great, but every dream has a price. If your dream doesn't have a price, you're simply induced by white castles. Maybe the dream for you is, I'm going to be one of the nation's best, you fill in the blank. If God gave me the opportunity, I'm going to be the nation's best this or do this for God. And after you get this message in your heart and you start meditating on this message, maybe let's say and play it out. One day somebody calls you and they say, hey, you're going to be this and I'm going to set you up for it. And you're like, yeah. And then it all settles in. What's next? Imagine after having this announcement before a group of people that knew you and you're ready for the next phase of this promise to come to pass and you have to wait 30 years. Oh, that's not uncommon because the God we're just about to read about, 
Y'all remember the story of David? At age 16, he's anointed to be the next king while Saul is still the king of Israel. No one knew about David. He was on the backside of the desert. His own father forgot about him. When the prophet Samuel came to anoint the next king, his own father forgot about him. But when he came to the meeting place, after waiting for a moment, the Bible says the anointing fell on David and he was called to be the next king. Could you imagine every announce, every person that heard this announcement are like, whoa, this dude? And so now he has this promise on his life. But what do you do when the promise on your life is outweighed by the process of fulfilling the promise? What do you do when you were told that you're going to do something great, that you're coming out of this, that this won't last always, but you're on your fourth year grieving? What do you do when you're caught in that place of transition and it looks like the longer you walk, the longer the valley experience is? I'm not talking to no fake folk this morning, am I? I want to talk to some folk who have been through hell and back and can say, I know what it feels like to want to give up. I know what it feels like to want to throw in the top. I know what it feels like to look the devil in the eye and he tell you, you might as well die here in this valley. Know what it feels like. Do I got any folk here today that's asking the question, how long will this be? How long will this be? <clears throat> How long? In this particular text of scripture that we're about to read, it is a series of rhetorical questions designed to motivate God to answer his prayer. David is asking God how long? Four times in these two verses. And then he says, before he could even get it out, he's saying, Lord, I need an answer now. He, he, he would wait. Before answering, but David felt ignored by God and he felt forgotten. He asked the question, would this be indefinitely? He was wrestling inwardly and outwardly and he lamented every day in this distressing situation. Oh, by the way, I need to tell you all who think that David is not close to you. David was called a man after God's own heart. In fact, God didn't even have to bother David. The Bible never shows us or shares with us that he aspired to be the king. You read the story of David, and it doesn't say anywhere that one day he said, I, when I was a little boy, I told the Lord I wanted to be king. No, he was following in his family's lineage. He was raising and being a sheep herder. He was keeping the family business thriving. He never wanted to be king, but God decided, this young man that I'm cultivating, I have designed him to be the king of Israel. God interferes with his life. God takes him from the backside of the desert, puts him on the forefront of the stage. God decides he is the next king. David never decided that, so my my point is this, if he's in this situation of waiting, guess who put him there? God. And if God can bring you to it, he can bring you through it. If God can bring you to it, he can bring you through it. But David feels forgotten. This text of scripture has three divisions that we're about to read in Psalms 13. Verses 1 and 2, exasperation. Exasperation. He's exhausted with God. He's mad. Verses 3 through 4, he entreats God. He, he, he's trying to grab God's attention. Verses 5 to 6, he says, I might as well quit all that. He exalts God. My brothers and sisters, I'm going to tell you there are three phases of your struggle this morning. There's the exasperation phase where you're like, I'm tired, I'm about to faint, about to throw in the towel, I'm about to turn my back on everything I know is good. Then there's the entreaty where you're saying, God, before I do, I need help. And if you can graduate to this last phase, you will become a more than a conqueror status. Where you say, forget all that, I'm going to praise him anyhow. Let's read the text of scripture found in Psalms 13. Can we read it together? How long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts? 
have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, Lord my God, give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. And my enemy will say, I have overcome him. And my foes will rejoice. I'm going to say this. Stop right here. Haters are defined as those that whisper your success, but yell your failures. Y'all know it. When you're doing good, they don't have nothing to say or they'll whisper to somebody. But as soon as you have a hiccup, girl, girl, man, did you hear about Willie Neal, man? I told you what goes up must come down. Go on. Verse 5. Pick it up with me. But, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise. For he has. He has. He has. He has. Been good to me. I want to give you some reasons why we ask how long. Some reasons why we ask how long. The first reason is because we feel forgotten. Because we feel forgotten. We ask how long because we feel like God has forgotten us. Look what David says. That he says in the first stanza, verse 1. How long, Lord? Stop it right there. Y'all see that? How, how long? Look what he says. Will you what? Forget me forever. How long will you hide your face? Now, we know that no man has seen the face of God. David was talking about the presence of God because David was the only non-priest in the Old Testament that could enter the presence of God without a sacrifice of a blood nature. David was the first one to get in God's presence without a blood sacrifice. The Bible makes it very clear. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. David locked into how to get before God without having to go to the temple once a week. He says, because the God that I serve, I need him more than just once a week. David says, i got to get in his presence when the priest can't help me get in his presence. Can I give somebody a helper this morning? You've got to learn to get in God's presence, irregardless of whether or not it's Sunday. Because your Monday devil is bigger than your Sunday devil. Some of us got to make our car a tabernacle. When folk are cussing and listening to all these morning shows, you need to say, nah, I don't need that this morning. Because the fight I got, I don't need to laugh at it anymore. The fight I got, I don't need to hear Tom Jordan anymore. I need to hear what thus said the Lord. I will bless the Lord at all times. And it's praise. The traffic we got with the bridge construction and all that stuff will make you want to lose your tongue. <laughs> Some of us got to learn to enter. David says, I, don't, I can't live another day without your face. David says, I got so close to his presence it felt like I was watching him. I would love for the church to get so close to God in worship that it feels like God and you are looking eyeball to eyeball. It will blow your mind how a loving God can look at a sinful person and still say, I love you. How long will you hide your face from me? And I want to share something else with y'all. Just because God's face is hidden, it does not follow that his heart has forgotten. Say that again. Just because God's face is hidden doesn't mean that his heart has forgotten. Oh, when you cannot understand what God is doing, when you cannot trace the presence of God, trust God's heart. Because God has you in the very center of his heart. But why did I have to go through it so you can tell others how God made a way? Well, why did I have to go through it? Because life doesn't exempt us just because we are God worshipers. And just because we're God worshipers, God is saying, because you got me on the, on the job, I'm going to do something extra special for you. Where other folk almost lost it, you're going to slip, but you won't fall. I'm going to hold you up. Some sufferings help us to understand how to love other people. 
I've learned to not say never. I've learned to not say it. I used to say it a lot. It don't never happen to me. And, and some of us live our lives trying to run from never and never happen. And now you're at that place where you have more compassion for the other folk that's been down the way you've been down. If you ever experience death in your family, you, you, you learn real quickly why folk trying to jump in caskets. You understand real quickly why folk want to try to jump in the burial grounds. Like, it looks crazy at the moment, but go there. It doesn't make logical sense, but when something you love has been ripped from you, you will too ask God, how long? The second reason we ask God how long is because we feel abandoned. We feel abandoned. Look what David left us with. How long must I wrestle with my thoughts? Notice that. Now, just, just, can I just share, can we get real? Can I just get therapeutic this morning? How many can just be honest that if we could just quiet our mind? Just our mind. If we could just say, shh. You know, the thoughts, man, the brain is a powerful thing. And if God could just help us to shut it up for a moment. What David says, how long must I wrestle with my thoughts? If you don't have God in your life to help regulate sanity and insanity, you will lose it. See, David felt abandoned because he was fighting his thoughts. He felt he was fighting his thoughts by himself. And then it says, and day after day have sorrow in my heart. You got to get this. Not for five years, not for five months, not for 10 years, not for 20 years. For nearly 30 years, David is on the run. I mean, there is no resting place for him. Everywhere he goes, he's a fugitive. He has to go to the Philistine camp. You know Philistines are the people he killed. And ask them for refuge. What does it feel like to be called the next king? And you have to go to the very people that are your enemies for a place of hiding. And I'm going to just say this, church. Sometimes the world treats us better. Because we throw and pick up our church rocks. And we pick up our church stones. And we are ready to throw them at people for which we are just one second from it ourselves. David has no resting place. He's called the next king and he's a fugitive. In one case, David had to act like a crazy man and let slob and saliva enter his beard and heart. Just so that the king, that so that the foreign nation would not kill him. They said, oh, he's a crazy man. He lost his mind. Isn't it bad when you have to act like you lost your mind just so folk won't judge you? The Bible says David felt abandoned. He says, how long must I wrestle with my thoughts day after day have sorrow in my heart? I just want to paint this picture so real for you that you don't dismiss the scriptures as though it's David and not you. No, it's you too. I mean, for nearly 30 years, this king that God messed up with, God messed his life up by calling him. And I'm going to share with you, the best and worst thing that can happen in your life is for God to put his hand on you. The best thing that can happen is God put his hand on you. The worst thing that can happen is God put his hand. Why do you say that, preacher? Because the day you're activated is the day hell sends everything he can. But I'm not worried about hell. Hell is defeated. Hell is defeated. See, when David was called, he got on Saul's radar. And Saul became jealous and envious. And instead of fighting the enemies like the Philistines and the Hittites and the Perizzites, which were nations around Israel, instead of fighting them, he spends 30 years chasing a boy. You talk about somebody out of place. You talk about wasting resources of the kingdom. Saul wasted 30 years of resources chasing a boy. David felt abandoned. The third reason we ask how long is because we feel the promise seems unattainable. 
I need to share something with you all. You need to start thanking God for your crisis. Studies show that human behavior conditions itself into any situation that life will present itself. If this area was 110 degrees all year round, you all wouldn't move. You wouldn't relocate. You would adjust to it. You'd adjust to it. You would get conditioned to the environment, and over time, it would become normal. Prior to it, when you first experience a temperature change, you are more vocal. It's so hot. Can't stand this humidity. You go around with poofy hair and all wet all the time, just, just body icky and ugly, and you're like, oh, I can't stand this weather, I can't stand this weather, I can't stand, and that's how it is in the first phase of noticing the change in temperature, but give you a few months, and you're not as vocal about it because you've gotten adjusted to it. You've gotten used to it. So you need to start thanking God for the crisis because the crisis is an indicator of something about the change. Some stuff you got used to was never your ideal environment. But you got used to it because you are a survivor by nature. But God says, I'm going to send you a crisis because I never call you to reside in a place that is not the ideal environment for your flourishing. So I send you a crisis because a crisis makes you make changes. Thank God for my crisis. It was my crisis that got me out of some stupidity. It was my crisis that made me look over my shoulder and say, I'm over here hooked to you. No, baby, I ain't got no ring on this one. I got to go. Oh, I'm over here hanging out with you. No, I thank God for my crisis. Thank God for my crisis. Your crisis got you to go to school again. Your crisis got you to start looking at your job in the right perspective. Your crisis start allowing you to trust God better and more. Your crisis made a praise come out of you that never came out of you before. Your crisis produced something powerful. Ask any mother in here and they'll tell you, if you go have something like a baby, get ready for some pain. But what I found and heard over the years is that it's painful and they even give you medicine for it these days and epidural. But I have heard that even though the pain is that when they see that baby, the pain just goes away. Let me tell some of you all about yourself. Inside of you, there is a medication called healing that once you see what you've gone through and why you've gone through it, you're going to say, ain't so bad after all. Hey! After all I've been through, I still got my praise. After all I've been through, I still got my mind. After all I've been through, I still got creative ideas. After all I've been through, I still am marketable. Thank God for my crisis. A crisis is another indicator of a season change, but it also is an indicator of a season ending. Some of us have been in seasons that God never ordained us to be in too long. Tell your neighbor, that must be, tell them, that must be a necessary ending. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. There's a time to weep but joy. It's coming in the morning. There's a time to hold on, but there's a time to refrain from holding on. There's a time for war, and there's a time for peace. Know that God will send you a crisis to end the season. Because if it doesn't make you uncomfortable enough, you won't make changes. You'll get used to it. You'll get used to it. You'll get used to it. Thank God he robbed your bank account. Praise the name of Jesus. Because when he was taking 20 and 10 dollars, you kind of let it ride. But when he took your whole check, you was like, you ain't got to go home, but you got to get out of here. 
Thank God she sliced your tires. You can replace, you can replace some Pirellis. Thank God you found out she was crazier than a road lizard on antifreeze. Thank God. Praise the name of Jesus. Because if it didn't get crazy, you wouldn't have made a decision, Superman. Some of y'all ain't saying that because you're like, I'm with him right now. You're quiet. <laughs> don't, don't play with me this morning. I'm in a no-play mood. But a Christ is even in a relationship. God allows it to break what's bad. Break it. It seems unattainable. But the blessing of the crisis means the dawn of a new season. A better season. You know, a better season is on the way. A better season is on the horizon. We oftentimes feel God has left us in this because it now seems that God will never bring about what he promised us. It seems unattainable. David says, how long will my enemy triumph over me? How long will my enemy? He had a lot of enemies, but one stood out in this particular text, and that was Saul. Only one guy he was really talking about was Saul, because Saul was the one chasing him down like a fugitive. He says, how long, God? I, I don't understand. Will my enemy win? He feels like the promise on his life now is unattainable because why? It's taken to what? Anybody ever been in a place where you knew God had you set up for something and it took to? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Some of y'all in that long season right now, and you're like, God, but I started out, and I was so energetic, and I was so energized, and I was so revived, and I was so amped up, and now I'm worn out, I'm tired, and I'm weary, and God is saying, when, and you're saying to God, rather, when, God, when, God, I'm going to tell you, stop asking when. You won't get an answer. Just to let y'all know that right now, he won't answer. So I'm going to just help you to answer that for yourself. He's not going to answer. God. I ain't take the air out of the room. I just want to help you out because I don't want you to be out here on sugar theology. He's going to answer me. I want you all to have solid theology. He's not going to answer when because he is not responsible to you. You are responsible to him. He is responsible to his name. I'm going to get into that in a second. And because you're called by his name, he cannot let the enemy triumph over you because you bear his name. And the Bible makes it very clear, wherever his name is, his name will be exalted. All right, I'll help you out. said all that to say what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 9. This is for free. Go to the next slide for me. He says it this way. Look what Paul says. Go, go to the next slide for me, brothers. Uh, this is what he says. Actually, I, it may not be. Here. here we go. 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 9. Find it for me if you can. Paul says it this way. He's under great stress. And I want to share with you all, there's nowhere in the Bible that says God won't put more on you than you can bear. Well, yes, it does. It says no temptation have taken you, such that it's common to man, but God will with the temptation make a way to escape. I'm going to share with you what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 9. He says, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the trouble we experience in the province of Asia. Look what he says. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, verse 9 we felt we had received the sentence of death. Y'all see that? He says, we thought it was over with. This was beyond our ability to bear. Oh, I love this next part. But this happened. Yeah, God. This happened so that you don't rely on yourself. But my reliance is on God. Pause, pause. Who does what? Have you all been in some dead situations? Folk wrote you off. Folk said you're without help. God is a professional at resurrection. He does what? He raises. He raises the dead. In every long problem and str struggle and trial, I need to say this because God is on the witness stand. The enemy is trying to prosecute God. The enemy will say to you, y'all know the enemy's voice, right? If God loved you so much, if you so good before God, if you just got up on Sunday and testified, 
If you told your prayer group and community group how you believe God, but look at you now. God's character is on witness on the witness stand, and God's character comprises of eight components. Like He's just and He's merciful, but there are two that stands out above the rest where the enemy tries to prosecute, prosecute God against us. Here's what it says: God. First of all, here's the first one: God is immutable, or He never changes. The immutable, the immutable nature of God, God doesn't change. The enemy wants you to believe when you're going through a crisis that God changed his mind about you. Or maybe you've been through some stuff, made some mistakes. The enemy wants you to believe you disqualified yourself from what he said about you. And that is, here's the word, here's the word. It's found in Greek. It's called a lie. And in the Greek, a lie means a lie. In Hebrew, a lie means a lie. In Shakespearean, a lie is a lie. In Bangladeshian, a lie is a lie. It's a lie. The enemy is a father of lies. God has not changed his mind about you, so your future is secure and eternal. Look what James says. Whatever is good and perfect comes to us from God above who created all the heavenly lights. Unlike them, talking about the angels and so forth, everything God created, he never changes or costs or or, uh, casts shifting shadows. In other words, God doesn't, God isn't for you one season and then against you the next. God doesn't say great things are going to come through you and then says, well, you are not quite ready because you blew it. God doesn't change. The second thing the enemy tries to prosecute God on is, God is unfaithful. But the reality of it is God is faithful, so you can trust him to always keep his promises. He's faithful. The Bible says it this way. Oh, Lord God Almighty, why is there anyone as mighty as you, Lord? Faithfulness is your very character. No, it doesn't look like what you want it to look like today. And I'm going to give you all an exercise. If what God said differs from what you see, change the channel. If what God said is different than what you see, change. The, how do I change the channel? Your words can help you change your channel. Instead of always seeing the problem, start seeing, saying to God, I believe what you said shall come to pass. Because our heart will speak through our words. Our words will help our environment to respond to what we say. If you always down and always depressed, your environment will speak to that depression and that downcast attitude. But if you start declaring the opposite of what you see, suddenly you're going to change the channel and you're going to say, whoa, my outlook has changed. So let me help you real quickly how to deal with the how long dilemma. I'm going to help you out through David's life. How to deal with the how long dilemma. The first thing David did in this text of scripture is David expressed his frustration to God. He expressed his frustration to God. I'm going to say that again and you go get it. He expressed his frustration to God. See, some of us need to quit telling folk that can't help us out of it our frustrations. I know, I know you like them and they're cool and that's your BFF, that's your friend, that's your road dog, that's your ride and die friend. I'm with all that, but they can't help you out of this one. They can't free you from the chains and the shackles of this one. Look what David said. Look on me and answer. Lord my God, give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. Turn the situation around by changing who it is you talk to. See, I understand about having people that are good to hear and good sounding boards, but a sounding board even gets tired. Turn your frustrations over to God. I love what Philippians says. Read that with me. Don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises, look with that word. See, I told you all your words will shape your reality. Look what it said. Will shape your worries into, 
Letting God know your concerns. Don't fret or worry. But instead, instead of worrying, pray. Turn your frustrations over to God. David says, I'm, 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 I, I, I didn't let God know how I think he's taking too long. I didn't let people who came and gave me some bread and some food and maybe a couple of blankets when I was in the cave sleeping. I didn't let everybody else know about my problems. He says, but God, look on me and answer me. Lest the devil win. See, this thing is deeper than just your survival through this season. This thing is about God bringing out what he put in you over time. And because God puts something in you, God does not believe in abortion. Say that again. Because God put it in you, God does not believe in abortion. He does not abort what he called you to do. So you've got to, you've got to become more adamant about what God said about your life than what the circumstances is speaking to you right now. Life is going to happen. Do you all know that in church life happens? Did y'all know that? Y'all didn't know that? Really? For real? You didn't know that life happens in the church of God? Did y'all know that? But just because life happens, God is not surprised by it. And some of us better quit kicking people out of the house of God because they made a mistake. Because God will turn that thing around and they might be the one that you need to bless you later. The second way David dealt with this dilemma is that David knew God's purpose in him would prevail. See, David had an understanding that God's name is at stake. God's name is at stake. He knew that if the enemy prevailed, remember, it wasn't David that asked to be king. It was God that said he was going to be the next king. God himself said, he's a man after my own heart. In the Bible, it says here in verse 4, And my enemy will say, I have overcome him, and my foes will rejoice when I fall. David says, hold up, Lord, if you don't answer me, if you don't come to my aid, my enemies will say they have won. And God, you didn't call me out of the backside of the desert so my enemies can prevail against me. So later on, David says in 31 Psalm, verse 1, he says, in you, Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be put to shame. David is saying, Lord, you're all I got. I don't go to anything else as a refuge. You are my only shelter in the time of storms. I don't have money to be my shelter. I don't have a lineage to be my shelter. I don't have friends to be my shelter. He says, Lord, you are my only shelter. How many have learned it's good to have folk around you, but when the real stuff starts happening, you need a shelter that won't buckle under the pressure. David says, God is my shelter. He says, therefore, Lord, don't let me be put to shame. Don't let me be put to shame. I love this, and this is our memory verse. Here's what David says later on, because now David is out of the problem. David is out of the problem. I'm going to say it again. He's out of the problem. He says in Psalms 138, though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. Ah, oh, God, you will revive me. You will, you will stretch forth your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand will save me. The Lord will accomplish what concerns me. Can you underline that part? The Lord will accomplish what concerns me. Your loving kindness, O oh Lord, is everlasting. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Did y'all get what David just said? I'm going through I've been on the run for 30 years. David is looking back saying, look at all God brought me through. He says, Lord, you will, here's the first thing, you will, first of all, you will revive me. But notice the first sentence, though I walk, you had to go through it so God can show you I'm still there. Though I'm in trouble, you will revive me. Oh, yeah, the devil thought you was out for the count. The devil thought he plotted well against you, thought he had you handcuffed for life. But God has a resuscitation strategy that he's going to breathe life into you again. Dream again. Sing again. Praise again. Worship again. Live again. There are some folks that's been through some stuff in here, and if you heard that story, and see how they're still standing. You will ask yourself how. That right there. God revived them. God revived them. He says against. He says and God you go handle my enemies. 
Your right hand will save me. The Lord will accomplish what concerns me. Which means God's going to fulfill the very call on your life. Some say, well, that's, what do you mean, ministry? I mean your life. I mean what he embedded in you. The enemy will not win. That book, you will write it. That business, you're going to build it. Hallelujah to God. Your way with daughter, your way with son, they're coming back home. Why? Because the Lord is not a man that he should lie. The last one is that David shifted his atmosphere. <sighs> Breathe. Breathe again. That's what they teach you in Le Mans, doesn't it? Don't they? Breathe. Breathe. Because when those contractions start coming, you've got to breathe. I'm not quite sure what the breathing does. But one thing I know is that it distracts your mind momentarily from the pain. David had a breathing moment right here. It's often known in the Bible as a Selah moment. He was he was going in on God. Did y'all see that? How long, how long, how long, when? Then he tells God, did y'all notice the forcefulness of look on me? Did y'all notice that compared to he's hidden his face from me? And then in verse 3, look on me. He was mad at God. Look on me. And David finally realized, I've been to exasperation. I went to entreaty. But now i got to shift my atmosphere. I've got to get to the place where I'm doing what he said right here. But I trust, look at that, every one of us need a big butt. I said every one of us need a big butt. What I mean is you've been going through life and hell and all kinds of stuff. You're asking God how long. You're mad at God because you're in it right now. And you felt it would never happen to you. But I trust in your unfailing love. We all need a but God. The devil thought he had me, but God. I should have been dead, but God. Should have literally lost my mind, but God. Should have lost my desire to build my business, but God. Should have lost my heart to ever desire to be a parent, but God. He says, but I trust. Look at this word, unfailing, has said. Love. This is the kind of love you all ain't never experienced. It's the love that ties itself to you irregardless of you. That's why David says it's unfailing. Y'all even heard the song, unfailing always on time. He says, my heart rejoices in your salvation. Here's the next shift. I will sing the Lord's praise. And then he concretizes his shift. Which means he makes his foundation solid. He says, hold up. When I really think about it, even though I've been on the run for 30 years, had to let slob and saliva into my beard and act like a crazy man, had to fight for the enemy's side because my own people would not give me a safe house, I had to run for 30 odd years. I was tired and worn and weary and my father and my mother forsook me. That's what he says. When my father and mother forsake me, he says, but I got a testimony. The Lord has been good to me. It ain't been good in the sense of good for me in the sense of my flesh. But boy, when I think about it, God has made a way for me. God made a way out of no way. He kept me floating. He held me up. He spoke to me. He rebuked darkness. He brought me the necessary food. Do I got about five people that can say it ain't been good, but God has been. That God has been good to me. Do I got about five folk that can look back over their life and think things over and say, oh, I got a testimony. Everything I've been through, oh, oh I thank God. I'm weeping may endure for a night, but joy is coming in. Give God a shout, hallelujah. Your house might have got foreclosure notice, uh, but God 
has been good to you. Your car might be breaking down, but God has been good to you. Folks may not understand why you're where you are, but God has been been good. Everyone standing. Everyone standing. Unfailing love. Don't, don't, I'm not done. I'm not done, guys. I'm not done. I got one more scripture. But here's what I need to share with you all. I need to hear this. You got to hear unfailing love. There are folks that are walking through the valley of the shadow of death right now. Some of you right now have gone through divorce court, you've gone through parental proceedings, and you're like, it's the life for me. I'm going to tell you, God's unfailing love. Yeah! I said it's unfailing love. Some of you all have been tempted by the enemy. Just throw in the towel, cut your wrist, take these pills, call it quits. But the unfailing love of God. I got some college students right now, and you already are facing midterms, and you're like, God, is this really for me? I'm going to shout something. God's going to meet you in that dorm room. God's going to meet you when you go and read your number on that test grade result. And you say, oh, oh my God. Look what God has helped me do. Some of you are right now are making some plans. And it seems like since you made them plans, everything has gone crazy. But the unfailing love of God, pain is necessary. Because it pushes us. This scripture here found in 1 Peter 4, verse 12 through 13 says it this way. Could you read that with me? Friends, when life gets really difficult, don't jump to the conclusion that God isn't on the job. Instead, be glad that you're in the very thick of what Christ experienced. This is a spiritual refining process with glory just around the corner. I don't know about you. If you got that revelation, but glory is just around the corner. Hold on, my brother. Hold on, my sister. Glory is just around the corner. Don't give up right now. Glory. He's making you. He's making you. He's making you. Can we just lift our hands this morning? I'm going to pray for you just that you would endure the process. Prayer counselors, come forward. There are some of you who got your hands lifted up. I'm going to pray a general prayer. I don't know your circumstance, but God knows every detail of it. I just want you to say to God, Lord, I know you're making me. Help me to endure. You can let your hands down.